All right, y'all, it has officially happened. Vladimir Putin has invaded Ukraine. So he gave about an hour-long speech and talked about what he's doing, why he's doing what he's doing. Here's a little bit of a breakdown. BNO News says, Putin orders troops into Ukraine. Putin recognizes Donetsk and Luhansk as independent. Orders peacekeeping mission in those areas. Very loaded terminology there. U.S. European leaders call for sanctions. Putin suggests Ukraine is not a legitimate state. Calls Ukraine a U.S. colony with a puppet regime. Um, so, let me tell you what the, the plan of action here was. Uh, what he's doing is saying, oh, I'm accepting their claim of independence. I'm officially accepting their claim of independence. Now, the reason why he would do that is then he could turn around and say, since they're independent countries now, well, I just signed a mutual military defense agreement with them so that he gets to go into Ukraine and now say, I'm not going into Ukraine. I'm going into these two independent states that want me here for defensive purposes. So that's the trick that he's using. He's, it's sort of like, you know, um, exploiting a loophole in international law to claim that he's not violating international law when indeed he is violating international law because it's not as simple as, you know, these regions saying we henceforth declare that we were independent. Now, another prediction I'm going to make here is what will happen in the long run is uh, at some point in the future, they will hold a quote-unquote vote, and the people the, of the independent republics, or whatever they're called, of Donetsk and Luhansk, will turn around and say, we voted with 80 or 90 percent to join Russia, and now we're part of Russia. So really, it, there, there are multiple steps here to get to the end result, which is what Putin wanted in the first place, which is basically annexing these ethnically Russian areas of Ukraine. That's what's going on here. Uh, now, the... Polish Prime Minister has demanded immediate sanctions against Russia, and they called for an urgent meeting of the European Council. We also have the Biden administration is going to impose sanctions over Putin's recognition of these breakaway Ukraine regions. Now, as of this moment, as I'm talking to you right now, and by the way, this will change very quickly. This will change within the course of hours, if not, you know, minimum a day or two. Uh, right now, the only sanctions they have against these regions are that, you know, it's illegal to basically do business with those regions. Okay, but, it, you know, well, it's not like... Not like Americans were doing a lot of business in those particular regions in the first place. They weren't. So this is more symbolic. But uh, I'm sure they're going to have a meeting, whether it's NATO, the UN, uh, Biden with a whole bunch of world leaders, and they're going to determine, determine a path forward as to how to try to deter Russia from further aggression here. So BNO News says Ukrainian President Zelensky is, is going to address the nation. Um, again, so he hasn't yet as of the recording of this, but he... Probably by the time you watch this, he will actually speak. Um, now, this guy here is named Clint Ehrlich, and he correctly predicted um, what was going to happen in this instance. And so I want to share with you another tweet thread he did here, because here's how he predicted it accurately previously. So he said... A sudden invasion from Russia of Ukraine is not going to happen. He was referring to that Wednesday invasion that the U.S. media guaranteed was going to happen. Clint Ehrlich said, that's not going to happen. He was correct that that didn't happen. He also said what's a distinct possibility is, you know, Russia did the whole, like, fake withdrawal from the border and claimed victory over the West, quote, without firing a shot. But what Clint Ehrlich warned is, what might happen is there's some sort of false flag attack or something that nominally draws Russia back in where they can say, look, we were being, you know, we were the, the peace lovers here and we tried to withdraw, but that only emboldened the West and then our people got attacked in these breakaway regions. And so now we have to go in there to defend them. And so he predicted that that could happen. And that's exactly what ended up happening. That you know, they, they like fake withdrew and then they turned back around and said that only emboldened you guys and made you guys more violent. So now we have to go in to defend our people and th these ethnic Russian people within Ukraine. This guy said this might be how it unfolds. If there's going to be war, it's going to unfold like that. And that's exactly what happened. And what happened is it gave the media time in Russia to make a propaganda campaign, build a propaganda campaign for war, which is exactly what they ended up doing. And it gave Vladimir Putin the time to, to give a speech and declare, hey, here's why we're doing what we're doing. So this guy predicted it. So I want to read for you his new thread and what he's saying. Uh, and then some. there's a lot of wisdom in this, but then there's also one part that I think he's missing, which I'm going to get to after I read this to you. So Clint says, The world is perched on the edge of an abyss. We may soon see the worst combat in Europe since World War II, killing thousands of people and raising the likelihood of nuclear war. 
It didn't have to be this way. A thread. What's happening? Russia has built up a potential invasion force on its border with Ukraine. Recent photos and uh, video show the Russian military pre-positioning attack helicopters and troop transports. It looks a lot like final preparations for a cross-border assault. Now, he was saying this all the way back in January 15th, by the way. Uh, why is this happening? Russia has issued an ultimatum. In the words of Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei uh, Rabkov, for us, it's absolutely mandatory to make sure that Ukraine never, never, ever becomes a member of NATO. The Russians insist that NATO expansion into Ukraine poses an existential risk to their security. President Putin argues that NATO missiles in Ukraine could hit Moscow within seven minutes or even five minutes once NATO has hypersonic weapons. Now, before I continue, let me just say, you're about to see why the narrative around NATO being the only reason why Putin is doing this, it's not correct. It's not accurate. Because there was a big uh, event that happened recently which um, disproves that this is the, the main reason or the dominant reason why Putin is doing what he's doing in Ukraine. So I'll come back to that, but let me continue with the thread. The U.S. and its European allies have refused to assuage that concern. They insist that someday NATO will expand it to include Ukraine, just as the alliance promised in 2008. And so from Russia's perspective, negotiations have hit a dead end. The time for words is ending. This was all foreseen by the architect of the U.S. grand strategy during the Cold War. George Kenan, or Kennan, was the diplomat who devised our plan to contain the Soviet Union. After the USSR collapsed, he warned that expanding NATO would lead us towards war with Russia. Kennan called the first round of NATO's eastward expansion in 1998 a tragic mistake. He said that our differences during the Cold War had been ideological and that with the collapse of communism, it was no longer necessary to treat Russia as an enemy. It is the beginning of a new Cold War, Kennan predicted. Of course, there's going to be a, a bad reaction from Russia, and then the NATO expanders will say that we always told you that is how the Russians are, but this is just wrong. Kennan went to his grave believing that his efforts to secure peace in Europe had been squandered by his successors. Quote, this has been my life, and it pains me to see it so screwed up in the end, he said. The irony is that NATO would prefer not to add Ukraine. The 2008 declaration was mostly symbolic, which is why Ukraine has never been presented with an actual timeline for joining the alliance. But we're ready to let Ukraine burn for the principle that it could join. The Biden administration is preparing to fight the Russians inside Ukraine based on the template of fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan. The plan is to train insurgents at camps inside NATO member states, then send them across the border uh, to Ukraine with NATO weapons. This is where it gets terrifying. The, th the thesis of this strategy is that NATO can kill Russian soldiers with impunity, that its member states can launch cross-border raids using NATO-trained NATO-armed foreign fighters, and that there is no real risk of Russia retaliating. But what if Russians decide to launch their own cross-border insurgencies inside NATO member states? What if Russian-trained Russian-armed fighters start killing NATO forces in Slovenia, Slovakia, or Poland? What Would we do nothing then, or would we retaliate? The problem with beginning a chain of escalation is that it's not clear where it ends. Once our countries are caught in a cycle of tit-for-tat retaliation, we inch closer and closer to destroying the world, to sacrifice every human life at the altar of abstract principles. In 1962, Khrushchev wrote to Kennedy to defuse the Cuban Missile Crisis. He said that our nations ought not pull on the ends of the rope in which the knot of war is tied because there will come a time when neither of us can untie it. Today, our leaders are busy pulling the ends of the rope the knot of war is growing tighter and tighter. I pray the day will never come when it shall be cut, but I am fearful. So, um, look, I think it's fair to say part of the reason why Putin is doing what he's doing is in regards to NATO expansion. I think Russia uh, views that as a genuine security threat, but it's certainly not the only reason why he's doing it. Okay, I'm afraid of the escalation. I'm afraid of the tit for tat. That's a horrifying prospect, and that's right where we are right now. We're on the edge of the abyss right now. But, there was a story that came out not too long ago, which we talked about. This is uh, February 17th. This is in The Guardian. Zelensky admits that Ukraine's NATO bid has stalled. So in this article, they go on to explain that Zelensky effectively said, look, do I want to be part of NATO? Yes. Do the majority of Ukrainians want to be part of NATO? Yes. The fact of the matter is, it might be a pipe dream. Uh, it's stalled. We're not joining NATO. Uh, if we ever do join NATO, it's going to be a very long timeline. It's not just Russia that's against it. There's, you know, players within NATO and within Europe who are against us joining NATO. So it looks like, ultimately, we're probably not going to be able to join NATO. This is the gist of what Zelensky said. Now, if you're Vladimir Putin and you hear the Ukrainian president say that, what would your response be if your main concern was, look, I just don't want NATO to expand any further? Your response would be, oh, based. Okay, I guess that's a massive de-escalation here. I probably should pull away from the border. I probably should withdraw. But Putin didn't do that. Putin still invaded. So, again, if I was in control of U.S. foreign policy back when we were expanding NATO, I would have argued against it at the top of my lungs and said, this is a provocation. They're not going to like this. That's definitely true, okay? But it is also true 
that this is not the only reason why Putin is doing what he's doing. Um, it might be one of a number of factors, but clearly in this instance, this is Russian aggression. You can't just invade a sovereign country and pretend like you're not invading a sovereign country. I mean, this is the shit that the U.S. does all the time, and when the U.S. does it, I oppose it at the top of my lungs and call it imperialism. So in this instance, I'm going to oppose it at the top of my lungs and call it imperialism. So now the question is, what do we actually do about it? Which is a much more difficult question, and I'm going to get to that in a second. But first, let me prepare you guys. Let me warn you guys. You're going to see a lot of brain-dead takes over the next week or two. It, literally every political faction online is going to say some absolutely nat IQ shit. Like, it's coming. Just buckle up. Everybody's going to say some insane shit. So first, let me warn you against one type of person who you shouldn't be, okay? Um, this guy, Caleb Maup Maupin, he said the following. What aggression? I think you are confused. The Kiev government's aggression against the peoples of Donbass is reprehensible. Russia coming to their aid is a good thing. So this is literally just spinning the invasion of a sovereign country as defensive. Like, it's not calling a spade a spade. This, this guy is so anti-US imperialism that he's pro-Russian imperialism. You see how that's a problem? Don't be so anti-imperialism that you somehow wind up being pro-imperialism. That's what this guy's doing. Look, we absolutely can and should denounce Russia invading a sovereign country. That's a very easy thing to do. You should do that. That's obvious. And unfortunately, you're going to see a lot of people who are fundamentally incapable of doing that. And that should drive you crazy. Uh, now, Vosh did a little end zone dance here, and he said, called it, with regards to Ukraine, hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. Specifically, prepare for all the pro-Russia imperialists effortlessly and simultaneously switching their narrative from Russia wants no war to Russia was given no choice but war. And that is kind of exactly what happened. So don't be this guy, okay? Don't be Caleb, because this really is a brain dead take. It's not that hard to say sovereign nations shouldn't be invaded. Yes, you can explain the, the nuance and the intricacies and the complexities and all of the surrounding circumstances which got us to this point. That's called being intellectually honest. And you should be open and upfront with what, you know, the different perspectives are from the different sides. But fundamentally, don't convince yourself that Russia invading a sovereign country is a good thing because it's not a good thing. It's a very, very bad thing. Now, so this is one extreme you have to worry about. I'm so anti-imperialism that I'm pro-imperialism. Here's the other extreme you have to worry about. And Newt Gingrich is the quintessential example of this. The Biden administration talks and Putin acts. This is such a clear replay of Chamberlain trying to deal with Hitler that it is more than a little frightening. Putin is pushing day by day and has no fear of NATO because he has no fear of the United States or its president. So very clearly here, and I warned you guys about this from the beginning, the comparison of Vladimir Putin to Adolf Hitler. Why is this comparison so immensely stupid and, by the way, more importantly, very dangerous? It's dangerous because what's the thing that you should do if you're dealing with Adolf Hitler? The thing you should do is a world war. The thing you should do is any and all actions, no matter how escalatory, to defeat him. So what does that mean? Does that mean U.S. troops and boots on the ground and literal World War III and hand-to-hand -hand combat? Yes. Does it also mean perhaps pushing that big red button that says nuke on it? Yes. Because to defeat Hitler, Hitler had global dominance ambitions, and he wasn't going to stop, and he was exterminating everybody along the way. He had a racial hierarchy he was trying to implement. I mean, it's, it's the embodiment of evil. Now, Vladimir Putin is terrible. Vladimir Putin is also not Adolf Hitler. There's no evidence he has global domination goals. Worst case scenario, he has sphere of influence goals. He has let me reconstitute the Soviet Union goals. And that's bad, and that's condemnable, but that is definitely not the same thing as global dominance ambitions. And if you think it is, you're just factually wrong. Both things are bad. One thing is way, way, way worse. One thing is everybody immediately go pick up a gun and deploy and go fight. The other one is, okay, let's find a path here that's viable, that's reasonable, that's de-escalatory, but also sends a strong message that this isn't acceptable. So, again, worst case scenario for Putin, he wants to reconstitute the old Soviet Union. Um, but it's also possible he understands the... He, he's a realist about the situation, and he understands that ship has sailed, and his best case scenario at this late date is to just sort of reconstitute certain scraps of the former Soviet Union by picking off ethnically Russian areas in post-Soviet states, which might be where he's at. Now, again, that's condemnable, and you should condemn it, but... 
Make no mistake about it, that's not Adolf Hitler. Because what Newt Gingrich is doing here, which is so dangerous, is effectively calling for World War III. Calling for U.S. boots on the ground. Calling for sacrificing young men and women, 22-year-olds, 25-year-olds, from Missouri and Compton, to go pick up a gun and go fight and die. Because he's massively misread the situation, because he is he's a neoconservative U.S. imperialist. So, those are the two extremes you have to fear. One extreme is... I'm such a lefty and I'm so anti-U.S. imperialism that I'm pro-Russian imperialism. The other extreme is um, Vladimir Putin is literally Hitler, which means anything and everything to stop him is on the table and necessary and should be used, which means maybe use some nukes, maybe uh, ground deploy, maybe immediately start World War III. Both of these takes are massively brain dead. So what is my solution? Well, you guys heard me talk about this earlier today, but I will talk about it again because it's very important. Um... Here's what I would do immediately. The Nord Stream 2 pipeline is axed. It's not happening anymore. I would tell Germany, look, you're going to get U.S. natural gas, and you're going to get it at the same price you were getting Russian natural gas for. We're going to sell it at a loss. We know that we're going to lose money on it, but we don't care. U.S. taxpayers will subsidize it. This is to undercut Putin and his government, and this is, of course, to send a message that you can't just invade sovereign countries. So no more Nord Stream 2 pipeline. The other thing I would do is sanction oligarchs. Now, that's a big difference. I would not sanction... I would not invoke any sanctions that hurt Russian civilians, because this isn't their fault. Don't blame them. They're people just living their lives trying to get by like anybody else. But I would specifically sanction oligarchs. Uh, there's certain economic sanctions you could do. There's freezing of bank accounts and whatnot that you could do with Russian oligarchs. I definitely do that. The other thing I do is, look, Azov Battalion aside, I would do everything I can. I talk President Zelensky, say you've got to axe the neo-Nazis in, in the ranks of the Azov Battalion. They're horrendous. They're evil. Uh, they commit war crimes. NBC was doing a puff piece on the Azov Battalion the other day. Absurd. But I would, I would talk to Zelensky, tell him to purge his ranks of neo-Nazis. Uh, but as long as we're not arming the Azov Battalion, I have no problem arming Ukraine in general so that they could protect themselves from Russian aggression. Uh, and then outside of that, you meet with world leaders to make contingency plans. So what that means is you get together with uh, all the world leaders here and you develop a plan moving forward to basically deter uh, Russian aggression. And here's what I fear. I think that Vladimir Putin is expecting the U.S. to respond in a certain way. He's expecting some sort of economic aggression on the part of the U.S. in retaliation for this. And I think Putin has an ace up, up his sleeve, which is he probably cut some sort of shadow deal with China so that if uh, the West sanctions Putin, China swoops in and saves the day and helps Russia economically. I think that's why he feels emboldened to do, it, do what he's doing here. Now, that's just speculation on my part, but I feel like he's got an ace up his sleeve. So the West needs to be... Um, equally organized and disciplined and think and, you know, think like you're playing chess and figure out a way to uh, deter his aggression, de-escalate the situation, and find a good way out of a horrendous scenario. But guys, don't get it twisted. Right now we're on the brink of World War III, and it's absolutely terrifying.